All right, once again, we're taking another uh, segment from our recent 10X webinars. I'm gonna look at past success uh, and the data here. This week, I'm really just gonna focus on uh, some recent examples of stocks that have gained greater than uh, 10X plus from our Keystone's buy recommendations. Uh, next week, we'll get into the data. Uh, let's look at five recommendations from our research. These are five amazing capital compounding small cap stocks we have actually recommended to clients. Now, I share them with you here today mainly because they make us look smart. Um, I'm kidding, obviously. Uh, what we like to do is study this group and find the commonalities in each success story and use them to guide our future investment decisions. This group not only includes 10x stocks, but 20, 50, 90. And in Hammond Power's case, 200x plus uh, truly portfolio changing stocks. Generally, what can we say about this group of five truly portfolio changing stocks? And, and I will briefly explore today the commonalities between these stocks to see if they can help us replicate past success into our future investment choices. So let's start by looking at size, because Brett said size matters. That was earlier. Uh, but by size, if we look at all of them, by market cap, that's how we're judging the size of these companies. Even a decade or so back, they were considered small cap companies. Below, we can see that one, not one had a market cap above about 55 million Canadians. So certainly micro to small cap. So I would say here, commonality number, number one would be each company started small before their share prices took off. Let's check industries to see if there's any commonalities here. So we have electrical equipment and parts, automotive repair services, paint protection for the auto industry primarily, engineering, geothermal, heating and cooling, and software. Now, if you think auto repair services and auto paint protection are the same industries, you're stretching the truth. The correct takeaway here is there's no commonality in terms of their industries. In fact, the wide breadth of the industries appears to suggest that there's far more important general factors at play here. So let's take a look at some basic financial metrics to see if we can find commonalities there. The first metric we look at is revenues. Did the businesses have any sales at the time of their recommendations before they started their ascent? We can see here, ding, 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 we have a winner, or in this case, five winners. Each business had produced sales prior to their ascent. Using a more stringent financial metric, were business producing net income at the time of their recommendations? Again, this is before they started moving higher. Once again, the answer is yes. Both not only were selling products or services, each were generating profits from those sales. Now, because net income is a far more stringent and specific criteria, financially speaking, and all match that criteria, we're going to take profitability as a more statistically impactful commonality. So commonality number two here between these great stocks is profitability. Let's examine whether any of the businesses were well known to investors or covered widely or even at all at the time of Keystone's original recommendation on these stocks. As we can see here in terms of coverage, Hammond, Expel and Water Furnace had zero coverage on our original recommendations. In fact, it took over a decade for any real coverage to show up on Hammond Power. Expel finally just got coverage a year after it had jumped to the NASDAQ. Boyd had previous coverage but was abandoned, and Jana had a singular non-independent analyst when we started recommending the stock. Generally, unless you were a client of Keystone's, the average investor had no idea these portfolio changing stocks even existed on our original recommendation. So basic commonality number three is that each of these stocks were significantly unknown or underfollowed at the time of their recommendations. There are many other factors, including strong growth paths, good management, limited share dilution, that are relative commonalities between these five stocks. But I want to keep the exercise basic today to give investors a basic, simple framework from which to start when looking to find the next potential 10x stock. So I'm going to summarize that today. At recommendation and prior to their ascent, each company was small, profitable, and unknown. 
Next week, we'll see if the data backs up this anecdotal case for profitable unknown small cap stocks. Yeah, I think that, you know, it's kind of interesting just looking at like the industry breakdown between <laughs> between the few because I mean, if I recall the story correctly, like Ryan was uh, Ryan and Aaron were both in Toronto not too, too long ago. And Ryan was on a panel uh, just talking about where to find, you know, these next best stocks, essentially. And I, I know one of the panelists uh, essentially was was saying, you know, to look for that next or to, to, to focus on these great themes, you know, yeah, be whatever it is. Like, for sure. Yeah, thematic investing where, again, you know, you can see kind of Ryan like outlines who would have thought that, you know, expel a paint protection company or you know boyd an auto body and glass repair company like you know again these aren't sexy themes um but they're good businesses good cash producing businesses and i just think it's interesting you know especially when you know we get we, we hear that in the market so so often where you need to be in you know 3d printing etc 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 and you know it if we can find a business in these themes that you know matches our criteria great you know th that's awesome but uh again um just looking for the cash flow is generally what we're trying to do yeah and and we were i always talk about this all the time the last decade uh, i mean there i was on you know probably a hundred panels over that decade and every time somebody has the greatest next theme um not once did i hear auto body repair shop consolidation being the great theme for the last decade and yet that was that is what Boyd does. That was the best stock to pick on the Toronto Stock Exchange over the past decade. Um, you know, anybody who said they picked that because it was a theme is lying. We don't, we're not driven by themes because we don't see investing really driven by themes over the long term. You're looking at great businesses that generate cash flow and compound that over time. And that's what we're looking for. And, and that showed you there was no commonality in the industries. It showed you there's something else at play. And I think those three factors there, small unknown uh, and uh, growing with profitability, you know, and, and that's really what we saw be a common theme. The data will bear that out. I'm going to give you a sneak preview of next week, but that, you know, the data bears that out as well. I, I just don't, you could, you could say that, you know, that is Keystone's theme, profitable <laughs> cash flowing businesses that compound yeah. over time under follow it. I mean, and they don't have to be small, but that's a theme for the ages. Right. Yes, that's yes, not a theme yes. that, that, you know, goes out of style uh, in six months, right. Or just out of, out of favor. And just on Brandon's comment as well about, you know, what we'd, lo we'd love to invest in exciting themes when we find profitable businesses that pass our criteria in those themes. Well, that's also how we know that the theme is real, right. That there's something yep. actually behind it investable. Right. I mean, if, if it's a theme where, you know, no companies are able to produce any type of profitability or cash flow, or you know, in some cases even revenue. Uh, then what? You know, at best, it's just it's it's too early. You know, you're you're pre pre commercialization, and at worst, it's it's a false theme. Yeah. And once yeah, you I, sorry, really, yeah. When, once you really see those themes start to evolve, once it's been recognized as a theme, a lot of times idea. those yeah, a lot of those times you are that being that macro investor, that industry investor. And a lot of those companies have already went up substantially in price once you're starting to see like those thematic ETFs or funds and so on. Those have already appreciated a lot. And a lot of time when you're buying those ETFs or funds, which Ryan was talking about last week, is you get a lot of stuff which just doesn't even fit that theme. And Ryan was talking about the small caps last week where they weren't even fitting the market size. But then in thematic investing, a lot of times you'll see stuff that's is tangently related to some theme or something, but it doesn't really expose you to what you actually want. So then at that point, you need to go to individual companies, which then you are looking at more of a micro bottom up approach versus a top down thematic investing approach at that point. I, I'd rather honestly back into a theme or accidentally come upon a theme yeah. by having 15 to 25 great cash producing, relatively undervalued growth stocks in your portfolio. Um, that's what happened with Hammond Power. I mean, I did talk about them in a speech about eight years ago as a way to play electrification, but that's not the reason we're buying them, but it happened to be, they, you know, played into a theme of electrification, but we already own that before all of that, because they're a good company, good growth. And if they happen to catch a theme, then you can, you know, get a higher multiple than people would have thought for a business such as that. And, you know, if you have 
15 to 25 of those in your portfolio have the potential of catching a theme with an undervalued stock. Then you get not only the growth that comes with that stock naturally as it grows its earning, but you get a multiple appreciation and an expansion of that multiple. And that's where you can get a real uh, tremendous winner. And that's, that's why one of the reasons why Hammond has been such a great company to own for, you know, the, particularly the past five years, but, you know, goes back 20 years, really. You know, I guess my last point is too, it's not that we won't like, you know, focus in on a theme and look through every single company in that specific sector or, or whatnot. We have done this, but, you know, in, in many cases, we'll, we'll do these comprehensive reports, look at all the names across a theme and come to the conclusion that we can't recommend anything. You know, this does happen. So again, we're not just, you know, recommending to be in the sake of a theme. Again, it needs to match our, our investment. Yeah, and I'll give you an example of Aaron looked at, we wanted to include cybersecurity into our research. And Aaron looked at every cybersecurity in Canada. The problem was there's four or five. We moved to the, and there was basically nothing that would meet our criteria. Moved to the US, US and there's about 58, 60 companies. And uh, we were able to five and four to net. And, you know, now it's up. 400, 500% since that time. But, you know, th that was a way to apply our criteria to a theme. If there was nothing that met our criteria, we wouldn't have had a recommendation there. There happened to be a couple companies and we picked what we thought was best in class and, you know, it's done well. That's a way of applying our criteria to a theme and successfully investing in a company that we continue to own and hold for clients today. 